Hey there, welcome back to Magnolia Bend. My name is Oren. I spent a good portion of my childhood working the land here with my grandfather, Jim Hingen. It was only about two acres of fields at that point, but it taught me a lot about growing vegetables. More importantly though, it instilled in me a sense of wonder about the world of plants. The fact that a massive tree can grow from the smallest of seeds is still amazing to me. In this video, we'll first look at the layout of the property here. That'll make it easier to talk about some specific plans we have for expanding our growing space over the coming winter. I'll also show you what worked and what didn't in our garden this year and the lessons we learned. All that's coming up, so stay tuned and we'll see you after this. Unfortunately, my grandfather's house was destroyed during Hurricane Katrina in August 2005, and he passed away the following year. Since then, the house was rebuilt in a slightly different location on the property, so that the site of the old house is now within the backyard of the new one. This yard is completely fenced in, so it's currently the focus of our gardening efforts due to that protection from larger wildlife. My mother is a big fan of raised beds and we had received some of those materials from her. So I started by using them to build a narrow bed along this fence, but that was a mistake. You see, I hadn't spent enough time observing the property at various points throughout the day and year. Had I done that, I would have known that this spot is way too shady for most vegetables that we want to grow. Because it got so little sunlight, the white squash we planted here quickly developed a fungal disease and died. I ended up moving most of the soil out of that shaded bed and into this metal one, which is placed in a much sunnier location, one that these peppers sure seem to like. So I thought I had learned my lesson. I made sure the next bed was built in a nice sunny location but I failed to notice something here too. One of the reasons this spot gets so much sun at certain times of the year is that these pecan trees don't have any leaves on them. So all the light from the afternoon sun can easily shine down through their bare branches. But once these trees fill out with lush growth later in the season, most of that light gets blocked. I still think this bed gets plenty of sunlight to grow stuff but it taught me the importance of trying to visualize the surrounding environment at various times throughout the year. There's something else wrong with this bed, but it's not so obvious just from looking at it. I built this bed directly on top of grass, just like you see here beside it, without doing anything to it other than covering it up with a bunch of limbs and leaves and then piling soil on top of that. But I realized as we built more beds that this approach can be really problematic. It's not so much that the grass comes up through the growing medium, because this bed is tall enough to prevent that. However, it seems that failing to break up the compacted clay soil underneath the grass creates a sort of floor that plant roots can't break through. That phenomenon was quite noticeable on this bed I built later. This was the same setup. I just threw the filler material on top of the grass, then covered it all up with soil and compost. The result was that the plant roots grew downward until they hit that hard layer of compaction. Then they just shot off sideways in all directions. Because of this, the roots couldn't reach any water or nutrients deeper in the ground, and that didn't do them any favors during the scorching dry heat of this summer. I talked about the drought conditions we've been battling in a recent video, which I'll link in the description. To remedy this, I plan on digging these beds out as deep as I can over the winter when there's nothing planted in them. I think it's better to do that now while the soil's still poor rather than later after many seasons of low till. Oh. 
The soil here is mostly clay and it's very compacted. But on the positive side, this clay is filled with nutrients. It was interesting to learn that the molecular structure of clay gives it a slightly negative charge due to imperfections in the way the molecules are arranged. And this negative electric charge is what allows clay to hold on to positively charged ions of important nutrients like potassium, calcium, and magnesium. With this amount of heavy compaction though, all the nutrients in the world won't do the plants any good because they won't be able to get to them or use them. So we knew we had to do something to loosen up this native soil if we wanted to use it. Armed with this new knowledge, I took a miner's pick and dug out a row along the east fence as deep as I could, removing the grass and busting up the clay chunks. We then mixed a bunch of our compost and leaf mold into it and sowed some daikon radish seeds and potatoes. The eventual success of those plants was proof to us that the ground is more than workable for our growing purposes. It just needs a high volume of organic material incorporated into it. I quickly realized that producing the amount of material needed was going to require a lot of work and a substantial amount of space. So I built this compost bin out of some old wood we had lying around. It's about one and a half cubic yards. Not long after that, our neighbor took down her wooden fence and she was kind enough to give us a lot of that old lumber, which I used to build four more compost bins next to the first one, and later a large bin under the magnolia tree in the front yard. So far, these bins have been sufficient to produce enough compost for our needs, but I have a feeling that might cease to be the case once we expand the growing area, which we'll get into in a minute. I'll save the soil and composting deep dive for another video, but I did want to briefly introduce our setup since it is such an integral part of developing a resilient growing space. Thinking back over this year, the first issue we had was a late freeze. There was a spell of really warm weather, so all the fruit trees and berries started putting on their blossoms. Then the freeze hit and took them all out, so we got almost no berries this year. The citrus seemed to have made it out all right, though. I trimmed them heavily in the spring, but they're fairly loaded down with fruit at the moment. As for annual crops, we knew that it was going to take a couple of years at least to build this soil up to where it needs to be in terms of fertility and tilth. So instead of trying to produce a solid harvest, we used this growing season to experiment with different plant varieties and cultivation techniques. Still, we were surprised with how much we were able to produce already. I haven't started weighing what we get yet, but I did try to take some photos. Much of the early spring growth was stunted due to the late freeze, so all we got in March and April were a few daikon radishes and some salad greens. In May, we started getting some cucumbers and zucchini, but the zucchini succumbed to the squash vine borer moth despite our best efforts to prevent it this year. The cucumbers, however, produced a large amount of fruit throughout the month of June. We also harvested a small crop of red Lesota potatoes in early June, along with some corn that had pollination issues. The harvest slowed down quite a bit during the sweltering dry heat of July, but we still managed to get a few watermelons, and the okra and tomatoes started slowly producing. But it wasn't until the heat slightly abated in August that the plants revived themselves enough to consistently produce fruit again which is even more evident in September with all the okra and tomatoes. These are the same plants that live through the summer. They just couldn't make this fruit when it was so hot. We also started getting some of these sweet peppers in September and they've continued producing well into October. 
Everything's winding down now as we approach the start of November, so we're mostly focused on the expansion and planning for next season. Although we did plant some turnips, radishes, and carrots recently, so we'll see how they turn out. One of the hardest lessons we learned this year was how much we're going to have to design this garden around the wind. When I farmed here with my grandfather, we did it on some fields way back in the woods or down at the end of the road. But growing stuff up here on the water is a whole different ball game. With nothing to block the wind as it barrels across the bay, we regularly get sustained winds of 15 to 20 miles an hour and gusts of a lot higher than that. That's not including tropical storms or hurricanes, of course. We lucked out and missed all those so far this year. But still, trying to grow something like corn can be a real challenge. And any trellises or supports that we put up have got to be pretty strong to withstand the elements. Another big issue here is the squirrels. They don't actually eat any of the crops, but they're constantly out there digging holes in everything, and small seedlings end up as collateral damage. I tried some home remedy stuff like peppermint oil, but it doesn't work. The best non-lethal solution I've found is a physical barrier like bird netting. I also set up a few grow lights indoors to give the seedlings a head start rather than direct sowing them. By the time I'm done hardening them off, they're big enough to withstand some nearby excavation. As the drought worsened over the summer, which by the way was the hottest summer ever recorded in South Mississippi, I couldn't help but laugh at something. The plants that I thought were too shaded were the ones doing the best because they were getting some natural protection from the blistering sun. I moved some container watermelons into a spot that gets afternoon shade and they came right back to life and started producing fruit again. I also had a positive experience using shade cloth to resuscitate some tomato plants that were getting sun scorched. What this tells me is that when a plant is supposed to get full sun, you need to think about what that actually means for you because down here, the full summer sun could be a death sentence for most plants moving forward. The one standout here under the hot, dry conditions was the okra. We tried this variety called Shows Okra. It's an heirloom variety from this very state, and it did incredibly well in both places we tried it. I planted the ones in this raised bed far too early, so they even suffered through that late freeze I mentioned earlier. I did cover them up with blankets overnight. But even so, that's damn impressive that the same plants survived both the hard freeze and the summer hellscape, yet still produced a solid crop in soil that's far from ideal. The cucumbers also did surprisingly well, although they're known for being easy to grow. But we did learn something important from them this year. Before I built this bed closest to the house, I buried about 30 to 40 fish carcasses all along the northern end of it. I had originally planned to do the whole thing, but I realized it was going to take too long, so I stopped and just finished building the bed. This inadvertently set up a little experiment that allowed me to directly observe the effects of burying fish underneath the crops. It's a little hard to tell from these images, but the cucumbers and zucchini planted on the end with the fish did much better than those with no fish buried under them. Not only was there more growth on those plants, but their color was a darker green as well. And that leaves us with a conundrum. On the one hand, I feel that no-till and low-till gardening methods have a lot of merit, and I generally want to continue moving in that direction. 
But the difference that burying fish makes is undeniable. And people spend a lot of money on fish emulsion fertilizers, so I'm loath to go throw all these carcasses in the bay for the crabs to eat. Right now I'm thinking it makes sense to continue burying the fish remains while we're working the soil and slowly converting it into something with good fertility and drainage. If and when we get the soil to a good place, we can always go back to low till at that point. I should also mention that if you don't bury these fish deep enough, the wildlife will go after them. You can cover them up with something to prevent that. There's another messier option, and that's to grind the fish carcasses up somehow into a liquid form that can be applied without disturbing the soil, but a machine that can pulverize the head of a large redfish is probably out of our budget, so for now we're just going to bury them. So that's a recap of this year. Here's what we've got planned next. The section of backyard that's most ideal in terms of sunlight is actually this part here where my grandparents' house was. Once the weather cools, we're gonna run a tiller and make this entire area into a plot of rows. I've been making as much compost as I can in preparation for this, so we can mix all that in with the existing soil and maybe throw in a little vermiculite or something to assist with drainage. This will greatly expand our growing space and give us more opportunities for trialing different varieties as we try to figure out which ones we like and which ones just aren't worth growing here. And I feel that there's something symbolic about turning this particular patch of land into a garden since it was the exact location of my grandparents' house where I spent so much of my youth. You can even see a piece of the house's foundation is still here. We'll have to dig that out before we run the tiller through. We've also got to finish setting up this rain barrel. I haven't been in a rush to do it since we've been in such an extreme drought but getting this system designed and built will go a long way toward reducing our power and water consumption and keeping our plants watered. So it's gonna happen sooner rather than later. And gathering up all the yard waste for composting is a year round affair. Well, like I said, we're gonna need all the compost we can get for the winter expansion. So we'll stay on top of that too. Well, I hope this has been a good introduction to our Magnolia Bend garden. As you can see, we're squarely in the building phase right now. So if you have any suggestions or insights, please write them in the comments. With your help and a little luck, we can once again turn this land into a productive and sustainable garden. Other than that, like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Good luck out there.